Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. So things are really festive around here because we're getting ready to have Laya's birthday party. It's the first time that we're gonna have her birthday party at the house. We've never done that before because usually the parties are too big to actually have in our home. I wouldn't even wanna do it. This year she's just having the soccer team for the birthday party and we're going to take them up to Santa Monica for the pier. So they'll come to the house and eat and we'll do cake here and then we'll take them up to the pier for the afternoon. We're just gonna rent a van and take them all up there. I'm really excited for today's video. I'm hoping that it's gonna be both provocative and inspiring. I'm gonna talk about why I've left academia. I'm no longer a college professor and I have become a YouTuber. Going from college professor to YouTuber is a pretty dramatic transition, but what you'll find out about me is that I am about the least arbitrary person you're ever gonna meet. I really just don't do things for no reason. I'm very deliberate and strategic in about all areas of my life. So this transition, although it seems kind of uh, dramatic, it's definitely one that's been thought through, given a lot of consideration and I've sought a lot of advice and came to this conclusion. And so I guess I need to give a few cliff notes about who I am in the first place. <laughs> who is this girl? Who is this girl anyway? I know that's what you're thinking, I know, it's okay. <laughs> I was born in Mississippi. My mom's originally from Mississippi. My dad is from Ghana in West Africa, uh, so I grew up in a bicultural household. We moved so many times when I was growing up, about 13 times uh, through nine different states. I have been to 48 states as a result of all of that uh, relocation and traveling. I was a competitive soccer player. I started playing soccer when I was eight years old. I started in AYSO. And before long, I moved on to club soccer. I progressed to the Olympic Development Program. And then when I was 15, I learned that Ghana had formed a women's national soccer team and I had the opportunity to go and try out uh, because I was a dual citizen because my father is from Ghana. So I became a member of the Ghana women's national team and I played with the team for seven years. My tenure with the national team ended in 2003 when I represented Ghana in the Women's World Cup. And then I retired from soccer at 22 years old. I really loved playing soccer, but my goal was to be able to pay honor to all of the years I had put in and the years that my dad had put in as my trainer and play in the World Cup and prove to myself that I could play at that level. And once I had done that, I was really satisfied and I felt full and complete in my journey as a soccer player. I was also always really academically oriented. I was a very bright child growing up. I loved learning. I loved studying different things. I was self-initiating when it came to learning different things. I ended up going to Columbia University for my undergraduate degree in environmental biology. And I actually did a minor in French. Oui, je parle français. J'étudie français depuis huit ans. Mais maintenant, je parle français seulement quand je bois de vin. <laughs> After I finished my bachelor's at Columbia, in 2003, I played in the Women's World Cup for Ghana, as I mentioned. I also met my husband that year. I went back to graduate school at Columbia and I was part of the Earth Institute's inaugural class in uh, climate and society. I had malaria when I was on the Ghana Women's National Team. When I was an undergraduate, I actually had a fellowship and I worked in a malaria research laboratory doing drug development research. But what I learned from that experience is that the process of developing a drug and bringing a drug to market is really, really long. And at the time, I was just youthful and impatient and I thought, I'm never gonna save the world sitting on this lab bench going at this pace. So I went back to Columbia to do that master's program in climate and society. And, I, and my underlying research question was, could we use climate indicators to predict malaria epidemics in East Africa, where there is a relationship between rainfall and malaria outbreaks? So eventually I went on, I did a PhD in public health. My research area really kind of morphed into more of looking at women's health in Sub-Saharan Africa and the concept and construct of women's empowerment. And I ended up getting a teaching fellowship and then moving on to adjunct teaching appointments in a couple of different great universities locally 
and I have taught classes on any subject under environmental science, intro to public health. Um, also, I had the opportunity to teach women's sports and empowerment through a grant that I won from the Kaiser Foundation. So I spent quite a few years teaching a variety of classes in environmental science and public health in the university. So why is it that I've left my life teaching as a college professor and that track and I've switched over to effectively become a YouTuber. Pretty significant change. I think the first reason or the first set of reasons I would describe as logistical, logistical reasons. As an educated and working woman, what I found is that our society is not quite organized to support the many roles that women are functioning in. I pursued my PhD with the thought that I would be able to reconcile that with motherhood. I'm very passionate about motherhood, very excited to have two children and to be raising them and mentoring them and helping them to become awesome citizens in the world. I just found that it was really tough logistically to reconcile my work schedule, the demands uh, of my job with fulfilling my role as a mother in the way that I envisioned it. So logistically, I was having challenges there. I also felt that in the organization, some of the organizations where I was working, that I was subjected to a lot of bias for my decisions to really prioritize my family. So it's just really funny because I think a lot of environments where we expect there to be more of a liberal mindset, we see that that uh, liberal ideology falls short if a person chooses what would be considered kind of a more traditionally conservative pathway. So I definitely had professional mentors, bosses, people who were in positions of authority over me telling me things like I should only have one child, I should make sure if I have two, I have them close together, that I should be, I had a bright future in research, but you know, that could be complicated, stifled, or derailed by having kids. In between my first and second child, I suffered a miscarriage and I feel as though now I know from a logical, my logical brain wants to tell me that there's so many different reasons why a pregnancy doesn't come to term, but I think that, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind, I've always been troubled or plagued with the question of whether or not I was under a lot of stress or kind of pressured to have my children so close together in my um, place of work that it might have, you know, been a contributing factor to the outcome. So I think I just got to the point where, you know, if it seemed that I was going to be forced to pick one over the other, that at this point I wanted to choose um, prioritizing my children. And it's a difficult choice that I feel like we set up in society for women to have to make. It's unfair in many ways. It's not just women, it's often men too. I know that now we have more and more men uh, coming out of the traditional work environment to kind of take charge of the household. But it again, it's just really unfortunate because um, accommodations really need to be made to people who can make meaningful positive contributions professionally, uh, but also want to be there for their families and for their children. Um, because parenting is a really important political act in and of itself. Kind of related to this, the second logistical reason is that I really wanted to be able to capture more of my own value on my own terms. So working in academia, there's several experiences that I had and several accomplishments that I had that I couldn't be compensated for in the traditional structure of academia. So for example, the fact that I played in the Women's World Cup um, is something that really did not translate to any value in terms of my salary or standing in the university. And my accomplishments and the effort that I've made in areas of my life outside of academia are so important and I think also carry so much value that I really had to rethink where I was putting all of my time and attention 
and rethink where I should be in order to get the greatest return on all of the investments I've made in my life across different d disciplines and different fields. I think it's something really important to think about because a lot of us are put into jobs that are very narrowly conceived, rightly so, but if you are a person who's an interdisciplinarian and you bring a diverse range of skills and experiences to what it is that you do, and you're in a place where that value cannot really be captured and you can't get the return on the investments that you've made, it might be worth considering a different kind of environment. If there's more to you than what is uh, demanded of you in your job and what you're compensated for, then it might be time to look at exploring different options. And fortunately, we live in the age of social media where you can kind of choose your own adventure when it comes to your life. I've jokingly said that I'm really hoping that YouTube will save my life because I have had such disparate experiences, such amazing stories to tell, but I have not been able to find one place where I can coherently tell the narrative of my life and coherently live the truth of my life. And I'm hoping that YouTube will be it. My God-given gift is really teaching. I have been a teacher my entire life. I remember when I was five years old, I used to just line up all of my stuffed animals and teach classes. When I was about eight years old, my grandmother came to live with us. She came from Ghana to stay with us and she was a brilliant woman, but she was never formally educated and she couldn't speak English, although she spoke five different languages. Uh, but I remember I was the one at eight years old who taught my grandmother how to write her own name. So I also remember telling her and teaching her that a man had been to the moon. Imagine that. At eight years old, I explained to my grandmother, who was probably in her mid to late 60s at that time, about aerospace, <laughs> the aerospace program that a person had been to the moon. Prior to that, she had not ever been privy to that information. So I really loved sharing information, teaching. Uh, I learned to speak my grandmother's language and was able to share more information. I was that passionate about being able to communicate and exchange information and ideas with her that at eight, nine years old, I basically learned my dad's language, native language, which is treat. So again, just logistically evaluating where would I be able to fulfill my greater life's purpose and where would I be able to find happiness and happiness from reconciling all the different parts of myself and all of the different desires that I have, not just to contribute to research on the environment or on women's empowerment issues, but also to be the kind of attentive mother and mentor that I want to be to my children and to serve in my community and I just found that in the environment that I was in it was extremely inflexible and as I said there was a lot of bias kind of based or rooted in the inflexibility. There's a very stringent rigid notion about what a professional woman or female academic should be like or should prioritize and many of my values just weren't really in alignment with that value system. Another reason why I've decided to make this transition to YouTube is really just practical. Practically, I have skills and experiences that are relevant and I have a capacity to learn what it takes to actually be able to record and edit and post videos and promote through social media. So practically, this is something that I know I have the capacity to do. Also kind of in this practical vein, I have a very fascinating, kind of interesting life history and fascinating, interesting day-to-day -day existence. I have a really, really different worldview. I've been really blessed to have been put in some very interesting circumstances in my life. There was a time when I was about eight years old that my family had moved to rural Illinois and I was the only African-American child in the entire school district. And that was a very powerful, interesting experience for me. I definitely grew in my character, but it was a, an experience that was more positive than negative. And I feel it was a very empowering experience for me ultimately, because I think that I was free from whatever the social norms were for girls or for 
black people or people of color. And so I was kind of liberated from any social expectation because I was the only person who looked like me in the community where I lived. So this really helped me to develop a sense of myself, an authentic sense of myself that I probably wouldn't have had in a more diverse environment, ironically. Beyond that history, as I said, we moved so many times that I have really connected with people all over this country. And through my professional soccer experience, I traveled so much that I've really connected with people all over the world. And then I ended up going to college in New York City, which is one of the most diverse cities in our nation. And honestly, I have friends from every walk of life. And I recently posted in my Facebook that I've got friends that are representing pretty much every religion, including atheism, pretty much representing every continent, uh, every age demographic. And what I've learned from that is that basically all people are crazy. All, all people are crazy. I'm not bigoted because I know how to hate all people equally. Yes, yes. <laughs> I sort of feel like I've lived so many different lives. I've had the experience of being on the women's national team and living in Ghana for longer periods of time, extended periods of time. And so I've effectively had the experience of living in a developing uh, nation and seeing what that's like and what life is like and humanizing people at that level of struggle economically. I have also had the experience of being married to one of the most prominent real estate brokers in the country who's based out of Beverly Hills. And I have seen what life is like at the very top of the socioeconomic strata. Uh, we have friends that are billionaires. I think that it's really interesting and rare to have gone through a full spectrum uh, on this earth of what it's like to live in Africa in you know difficult circumstances or to have been in rural Africa and to relate to that even through you know my family and my extended family all the way to talking about some of the richest and most powerful people in the world so I think that is part of what gives me a very unique worldview it's just worked out for me because I've always been more curious than judgmental. So definitely encountering people that are different than I am, I've always been more provoked and interested in understanding their life and their way of thinking than being quick to rush to judgment on what I think is right or wrong in the way that they're living their life. It doesn't mean that I don't believe in right and wrong. I do have a pretty strong, firmly rooted value system, but honestly, I love people. I'm fascinated by people. I'm entertained by people. I am disgusted by people. I think, you know, people are amazing. I'm a natural sociologist. I, I say that all the time. And, you know, for all the successes and interesting stories that I've had, I also have had a lot of hardship and painful stories too, you know. I am a person who has survived sexual assault. I have survived pretty serious injuries as an athlete. I once had a concussion and I was narcoleptic for four months. I've survived pretty serious illnesses. As I said, I had malaria, so I've definitely faced challenges with regards to my health. I've suffered, you know, I've had people that I really love I've lost people that I really loved. Fortunately, um, no one in my immediate family, but I, I remember when I lost my grandmother and that was something that really was hard for me. That was hard for me. So definitely a lot of different stories and experiences. I've had opportunities denied to me because I was a woman, because I was a person of color. I've had to deal with all of those things. So, you know, it's life. It's real life, it's real life. But you know, just because there were logistical challenges in my traditional career path, and just because I kind of have a few practical skills that could help me do this, and I feel like I have an interesting story, I don't even know if that's really enough um, to make me leave academia where I've obviously invested so much time to transition to something like this. But I have more important solid philosophical reasons why I think I've made this transition. So from a philosophical perspective, the first thing has to do with Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know if you've ever read that book, but he 
makes this argument that if a person is able to dedicate 10,000 hours to anything, they can become a prodigy in that endeavor. So basically there's this relationship between dedicating a fixed amount of time to achieving prodigiousness in that area of your life. And I really believe this, but I even take it a step further. Well, I believe that after you've devoted that 10,000 hours, you should roll that entire experience into something new. So I learned for myself that that 10,000 hours is about a 10 year window. And my first 10,000 hours was dedicated to soccer and it culminated with me participating in the Women's World Cup. My second 10,000 hours was dedicated to academia and I have been able to produce some great research, to contribute to UN publications, to give a TEDx speech related to my experience uh, playing soccer but tied to my research in women's empowerment. I've been a speaker at Yale. I was actually invited by the government of Ghana to present my research. So I have definitely had some significant level of achievement in academia as well. Now I think it's time for me to look at my next 10,000 hour cycle and to see where I want to dedicate myself for the next approximate decade of my life or a time period in my life and see what I can achieve there. I think that after you've put in that amount of time, it's important for you to kind of level up and take your experience in a new direction. I am an interdisciplinarian at heart. I think that the experience that I had in soccer really served me in my study of the environment and women's empowerment. And I was able to bring that experience from soccer, which seems to be almost unrelated into this academic discourse and I think that it was a very valuable contribution. So now I'm kind of taking my experience in athletics and my experience in research on women's empowerment and the environment and trying to roll that into a whole new <laughs> pathway, but I think it's going to be awesome. Listen, we don't want to be stale in life. We want to maintain our passion and our energy and our vigor. When we get up every day, we want to feel excited about the possibilities in the day. And I think a big part of that excitement comes through learning something new. So I am deeply passionate about this idea of investing your time into something so that you get a mastery of it, but then also moving on to pursue mastery in different areas. So that's also partially what this is about for me on a personal level. Also in terms of my philosophy on life, I kind of feel like starting a YouTube channel is a radical political act. Here I am, this woman of color who's married, who has this family, these two great kids. I just don't think that there's enough representation about my life out there. And so I have always said this for a long time, long before I decided I wanted to uh, pursue YouTube, I've said that every time I post on social media, I feel even a higher social obligation to just represent people, families, communities that look like me. So posting about my life, what we're doing, my marriage, um, homeschooling, all of these different things that are going on in our lives, me as a soccer coach, a female soccer coach, all of these things are not what is in alignment with social expectations or social norms. And I think that it's disruptive to patriarchy, to racism, to classism, so many different things. I mean, I think that I have a real responsibility to share in my life in terms of educating, informing, and inspiring people so that they can feel like more is possible in their own lives and so that they can develop uh, more loving attitudes towards people that are different than they are. Life is actually really nuanced. We want everything to be black and white and discreet, but you know what? There's a lot of nuance and that's where the beauty of life is. It's in the nuances. And I feel like my life really captures that. It kind of sums it up. There's a lot of nuance here. I feel like I am an empowered feminist who works at home. And you know, I've prioritized raising my kids. These are things that are difficult for society to reconcile that a person would pursue their education all the way up to effectively the highest level and then decide to step back from that in the interest of 
children and also to just kind of pursue my own happiness and to really search and fight for a place where I feel truly, totally enfranchised with the whole breadth of my life experience. And the final reason why I've decided to do this is because I've just decided to go for it. Not too long ago, my pastor told a story at church about a mountain. And I'm not sure where this mountain was. Oh my gosh. I was paying attention though. I promised Pastor Jimmy I was paying attention. <laughs> it's a mountain that people really love to climb in groups. Um, but about 85% of the way up the mountain, there is a restaurant. And it's so strange. I'm like, a restaurant on the side of the mountain? How do they get supplies in? Like, who are these people? Where do the people who run the restaurant live? There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions. But bear with me for the point of the story. I guess people get to this point and then they go into the restaurant and they're able to take off all of their stuff. They come in out of the snow. They're able to take off all of their stuff, eat some food, relax, get warm, feel comfortable. And then after a couple hours pass, it's time to go back out into the snow and summit the mountain the rest of the way. Now, this is where most people fall off. What they decide is they come back out, they're like, it's so cold, let's just go back down the mountain. We've made it far enough, we've got some pretty good pictures, uh, this has been a success. We don't have to go the rest of the way up. And of course, that last 15% are the most treacherous circumstances. It gets colder, it gets snowier, it gets more difficult. So very few people are able to actually summit this mountain because they've been lured in and achieved a certain level of comfort. This is such a powerful metaphor because I think that this is where a lot of high achieving people fall short of their fullest potential. And you reach a certain level in life where you've achieved quite a bit and you are able to enjoy some comforts that you've achieved through what you have worked for and what you've accomplished. But I think the greatest icons, the greatest people in our society are the ones who will go back out into the cold and commit to pushing themselves the rest of the way to really summit the mountain. So this is a conversation I've had with my husband, who's also a very talented and very highly accomplished individual. The two of us had a conversation and we just committed to summit. We decided that we were going to push ourselves the rest of the way up the mountain and really push ourselves to max out our entire potential. So for sure, I'm a process-oriented person. Only process-oriented people engage in PhD programs, really. <laughs> but what I'm saying here is I have decided to commit myself to a new process. What I really believe sincerely is that this process for me is like going back out into the cold to go the last 15% of the way up this mountain to self-actualize. So that's kind of what this is about. This is crazy. It's amazing and it's kind of crazy that YouTube is the vehicle, but this is where I am. I hope that this is kind of encouraging or inspiring to anybody who's on the fence about making a transition professionally or who's thinking about starting their own channel or vlog or blog or anything like that. I think there are some real reasons to look at the opportunities that are before us because of the technology that's available to us right now to see if we can really self-actualize, achieve greater potential, achieve greater positive influence, put more positive messages out in the world uh, through you know, these mediums. I, so I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who's been watching my videos, who's subscribed, who's sent me messages of encouragement, but I just want to share a little bit of my heart and explain what I'm even doing. <laughs> and I guess this is also in a way a message for my parents to just let them know I haven't gone off the deep end. I, I have a plan. I have a plan. Bear with me. <laughs>